Advent 2002, the first time that I ever celebrated the season of Advent in an Episcopal church that I wasn't sure what my feelings were about it. I was new, newly married in a new city. I barely knew a soul, except for my new husband, Jimmy, feeling alone and scared, being invited into a season of waiting and longing as I wondered if New York City would ever feel like home. Advent 2003, the war in Iraq had broken out earlier that spring. The Bush administration's response to the attacks on September 11th, initiating a bombing campaign of shock and awe, if you remember that phrase, that led to hundreds of thousands of lives lost. Advent 2007, after years of trying to start a family, going down that painful and vulnerable road of infertility, Jimmy and I finally letting go of this life that we'd always envisioned of ourselves with children, not knowing what life would look like without them. Advent 2012, my first advent as an Episcopal priest. Ten years after coming into this strange foreign worship tradition that I wasn't a fan of at first, and now here I was, inviting people into this season of longing and waiting with me. Advent 2014, when I joined thousands of New Yorkers across the city on its streets, protesting the acquittal of Officer Daniel Pantaleo for the death of Eric Garner, and where those words, I can't breathe, Eric's words as he was being choked to death, became the collective cry of that movement. Advent 2020, an unprecedented global pandemic swept through the world, taking millions of lives, where Zoom and masks and hand sanitizer and not being able to gather like this, like we are right now, became our daily reality. And now here we are in 2024, you know, time is a funny thing, isn't it? I remember when people thought that Bush was the worst president that we'd ever had. 2002 Christine would have never in a million years imagined that she'd become an Episcopal priest, you know, or that New York City would become the home that she would live the longest in her life. Now, this is just Advent in my life and in my lifetime, but if you did this exercise, there would be other significance that you might name. Maybe some of them would be the same. Some would be different from a year ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You know, if we go back to further generations beyond our lifetimes, what was happening in the world? What was happening in people's lives at this time every year for thousands of years, before Advent was even like a thing in the church. You know, Advent has this way of bringing chronos time, so that's time measured by days and months and years, and kairos time, you know, which is that different quality of time, what's sometimes called the fullness of time, the opportune time, eternal time. You know, this perspective on this moment, this chronos moment that comes from the outside of time. And what makes Advent such a, just a really amazing season is that Advent collapses all these different kinds of times, the past, the present, and the future into this one season. And there's something about it that just feels right to do that as we begin a new church year today. So Advent, as many of you may know, means coming. And we talk about how this is the season where the church celebrates these three comings of Christ. So his first coming as Jesus in the incarnation as a baby born in Bethlehem. His second coming as a returning king come to make all things right. And the way that Jesus comes to us today. I mean, in many ways, that's the gospel in a nutshell. 
You know, N.T. Wright talks about how when the first followers of Jesus, you know, in the, the kind of the excitement and the joy and the flush of the resurrection began proclaiming the good news, their message could be summed up as something happened in the past, which means that something will happen in the future. And because of this, everything has changed for today. Now, I don't know about you, but most of my life is lived feeling like time is kicking me in the butt. You know, from one thing to the next, one meeting to the next, email after email, task after task, organizing events, you know, we're just responding to the kind of craziness and messiness of life, like day after day. Like, I cannot believe it is already December. Can you? It just, 2024 just flew by so fast. Well, what the season of Advent does is that it invites us into a different way than what we're used to. It invites us to slow down and inhabit this cyclical nature of time. And in so doing, it helps us to see what's happening in our world and in our lives from that Kairos perspective, which is a subversive perspective. Like we think that the headlines in the New York Times are the main story. But Advent's headline is always the same, no matter what's happening, and it grounds us in what God has done, will do, and is doing today. So Jesus came, Jesus will come, and Jesus is here, right here, right now, no matter what is happening, year after year after year, war after war after war election after election after election, through births and deaths and infertility and marriage and divorces, like the highest highs and the lowest lows of the human experience that bind us all together, no matter what our social station in life might be, that God is with us through it all. Now, I always say that Advent is my favorite season because it always feels the most true, like the most resonant. So when Lent comes around, I don't always feel like repenting, all right? I'm just being real. You know, when Easter comes around, I don't always feel super joyful. I don't always feel like rejoicing. But Advent has this way of holding me, you know, of holding us like our world of like light and darkness together, you know, of beauty and brokenness together. And it helps us name our longing, you know, the longing for our world and our lives to be healed and whole and to hold that longing in hope, not despair or cynicism or stoicism, but bringing, you know, as that Christmas hymn says, the hopes and fears of all the years rest in thee tonight rest in Jesus, past, present, and future. So in our gospel reading for today about the second coming, so upon first glance, it is actually quite a foreboding passage. And if you read the entire chapter of Luke 21, it's actually even worse than you thought it would be. So it's saying nations will rise up against nations, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes, famines, plagues, persecutions, betrayal, death, destruction. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, distress among nations. Like Jesus, like, I'm not going to lie. It's bad. But you know what? That could be a New York Times headline, right? Like this could have been a headline in the first century. You know, it doesn't make it you feel any better about it but these things have always been and so you can understand why every generation from the very beginning thought that their generation would be the last before the apocalypse and so what jesus says is jesus says and so look you know look at this fig tree and all the trees he says as soon as they sprout their leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. You know? In other words, what he's saying is he's saying, so pay attention to what God is doing. Like that fig tree, it may look like it's dead in winter, but it contains all of the life force of the universe in its roots and its branches. And you just wait, wait, 
And you'll suddenly start to see those green shoots, you know, to popping out and starting to bloom. So pay attention, he says. Otherwise, you might miss it. You know, so many of the stories and parables of Advent are all about this idea of, like, waiting for the bridegroom, you know, waiting for this presence to come, and that there will be many who miss it, who miss that coming. So Advent's waiting is not this, like, passive waiting. It's the waiting, imagine, of a night watchman on the wall with his eyes just like right on the horizon and he's waiting for the dawn to come. It's like that kind of waiting. So in that sense, you know, Advent is also a season of discernment, of recognizing and responding to the presence and activity of God. You know, I remember in that year of 2007, you know, when Jimmy and I were honestly grieving the loss of this future family that we would never have. And I remember we were in Kyrgyzstan visiting my sister who was a missionary there and it dawning on me for the first time, like this might not happen. And I remember, I think I cried every single day for two weeks straight. And I remember like a very consequential walk that Jimmy and I had. And we just started walking and talking and just sharing our sadness with each other when this question came to mind, like, where is God in this? And I remember like a shift happening, you know, where we kind of said, okay, like, do we believe that God is good? Yeah, we may not always feel like it's true, but we know in our bones that God is good. And so we just began asking this question, all right, if we really believe that that's true, how might God be good in a life that doesn't have children in it. And we just started just trying to be open, trying to look, trying to see, trying to use our imaginations. And we started saying, well, you know, without children, at least we like each other, <laughs> you know? And it made us grateful for our marriage. We began imagining, well, maybe without children, it gives us a lot of freedom, you know, like we don't have to worry about providing for little ones. Um, it gives us a lot of space in our lives to take some risks that we might not have taken if we did have kids. Um, it also made us think about our resources, you know, and the fact that uh, we had a lot more to share with people, that maybe we could be family to people who didn't have family. Now that was 2007. So what is that? Somebody do the math for me. 17? Wow. 17 years have passed. And in that moment, especially in like the darkest, saddest moments of that journey of infertility, like I, like there were moments when I could not see God in that, you know, but then slowly, you know, we began to look by the grace of God, just to look and to see and to say, Jesus, where are you? God, where are you in this? And now I can give testimony 17 years later. I can't even believe how time has flown. 17 advents later, I can say that truly Jesus has been Emmanuel, you know, God with us. And that if you told me 17 years ago that our cups would be as full as they are, not without sadness, I'm sure that we're probably going to mourn not having children. Maybe we do, you know, in our moment, in our, in some moments. And, you know, maybe we'll mourn it differently than we will in our 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. I don't know. You know, but if I can look to the past, I can see those glimpses, those like little green shoots on that fig tree. Um, I can look back now and say, yes, the fig tree blossomed in beautiful ways that I could have never expected, including now standing in front, of, in front of you as an Episcopal priest. And so we're discerning. We're saying God has acted decisively in history through the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Like the course of human history has changed because of him. And so this river of time is flowing. It's cyclical, 
And it's also moving towards this glorious end, as it says in Revelations, of God making all things new, when sin and death will be no more, when every tear will be wiped away, and when that river of life in that vision in Revelations 22 from the throne of God flows through the streets of the city, and it says that the trees will spring up for the healing of the nations. I mean, don't you long for that? day, you know, to see the actual healing of the nations that we see on our headlines every single day, the healing of the nations. And that day is, it's not today, but the hope of Christianity, the hope of this Christian story is that one day that day will come. And so Christ has come, Christ will come, and Christ is coming today. And what that does is that means that it's a call to us in this Advent time. We are an Advent people, not passively waiting for some future day, but saying because we know that day will come, that we will give our lives, we will spill our blood, we will take risks, we will do the hard and painful task of helping to bring forth this new life, this new world that was born in the heart of our Lord. And so that requires us to see and to look. And so this Advent, the invitation is, don't fall asleep, don't be asleep, but be awakened to God with us, Emmanuel. So if we're truly grounded, or at least trying to find our grounding in these two comings of Jesus, how shall we live today? How is God calling you to live today? So in Luke 22, like right after this chapter, it says in verse one that that was the moment when the religious leaders began to plot to kill Jesus. And you see in the rest of Luke, the pace of his journey to the cross starts just rapidly, just quickly starts moving. And it becomes the fullness of time. And Jesus, just so aligned with the Spirit of God, so attuned to the movement of God's Spirit in the world, he knows that his time has come. And so he begins to set his face towards Jerusalem and face his death because he knows, in the same way that nature knows, that paschal mystery, that things have to die before they can rise again to new life. And so for you in this season, you know, maybe it's a season of facing death, you know, whether it's your own mortality or someone that you love. You know, for me, it's my mom in the hospital right now, and I know that her time is coming, and so I'm holding that, this advent. Maybe it's the death of a dream. You know, maybe it's the death of a way of being, you know, this way that you've been and you're sensing something is, has to change, something needs to shift in me. You know, maybe it's seeing green shoots, you know, starting to blossom on this tree, that something is stirring in you, something is calling you to action, you know, something that you feel is, is, is being born in you, just like being a, a pregnant mother, you know, with this mis mysterious life force at work in her. And like maybe it's, it hasn't been born yet, but you sense this feeling of expectancy that something is coming, something's shifting. So I didn't want this first Sunday of Advent to pass to just give you a moment to just reflect on that. You know, like as you come into this time and this space, you know, what feels top of mind, you know, as we talk about waiting and expectation, you know, as we talk about that mysterious cycle of the Paschal mystery of death and life and resurrection, you know, of being in this already not yet of God's kingdom and of this Advent world that we live in. So I'm just gonna invite us to just bow our heads to give us some focus. I know sometimes it can be hard to concentrate when we invite you into moments like this. But just to give us a quiet moment, just to invite the Holy Spirit to illuminate our hearts this morning. What are you longing for? What do you sense stirring within you?
Where do you need to ground your hope this morning? I'm going to invite you to put your hands over your heart. As we press into hope as the season begins. And just repeat this prayer after me. Come, Lord Jesus, come. 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 Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. And all God's people said, Amen.